Well, it's good to be back here with you guys. Uh, I, I wanted to s- extend a couple of thank yous uh, to, uh, particularly to to Connor uh, and to Josh and to Hannah and to John, uh, just for being kind of just covering home base uh, while I was out the past two weeks. So we can just give it up for them. Thank you, guys. Also, if, if your life group leader is in the room, like give him a high five. Um, yeah, there you go, Patrick. There's a high five. Uh, just because your life group leaders are awesome, um, and I just want to make sure that you you guys show them some love today. But um, yeah, so Sophia and I we went to the Netherlands for about two weeks, uh, the, the past two weeks to go visit uh, some family, and it was a great time to be with with uh, with all of her family. And so uh, her her grandparents are 93, and tomorrow the other one will be 90. So they're getting they're getting pretty old. So any time that we can get to kind of spend time with them. It was really, really precious. So um, thank you for just being gracious with us in that as well. Um, I got to hold my, gosh, this is, I think I'm an uncle seven times over. So my, my oldest sister, she just had her fourth uh, and he was three, she, yeah, he was three weeks old. He, uh, he also like weighs like 10 pounds. He's like, he's like straight up a rugby player right out of, uh, yeah. And so uh, he was, he was adorable. Um, I got to hold him and it was, it was a great time. So um, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you to all those people as well as just to let you guys know a little bit of where, of where I was. Uh, and so we're, we're going to kind of just fall back into sync with what we do every single week. And so uh, we're going to start here in, in a moment and just pray, pray for our hearts, pray that God would prepare us for uh, the sermon uh, to come, that he would prepare my heart as well. Uh, and then we'll get into where we are going for the next couple of weeks. So why don't you guys bow your heads with me and then we'll pray together. Father, from Father in heaven, what we need most, more than anything else, is you. Is the truth that comes from your word to sink into the soil of our hearts and to change us and to make us new. And so, Father, that's why we come every single week to open up your word, to be refreshed anew again by the truth that you have given to us in your word. And so, Father, we, we come into this time with uh, varying degrees of readiness to listen to you. Father, this isn't about listening to me. It's about listening to you and your Holy Spirit. And so, Father, would you soften our hearts? Would you open our ears? Would you help us to maybe just for about 30 minutes to set aside everything else that's going on and to hear what your word has to say today? Um, Father, I just thank you for and give you thanks for this time of worship that we just had where we got to just praise you for, for how great you are. You are the very breath in our lungs. You are the one who, by the power of your word, is holding all things together. And that is good news for us. Because if there's anything that we know is true, it's that we're not in control. And typically the things that we tried to hold together, they fall apart. But Father, when our lives are in your hands, Father, we are safe. And our life and our heart is secure. And so, Father, would you move our hearts to that place of trusting in you even this morning, and especially now as we open up your word together. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Today, we are going to be starting a new series called Habits. And yes, that is the Wordle thing. Yes, you're all welcome. Uh, Did any of you guys get crushed by the Wordle word like two days ago or three days ago? Yeah. Okay. Okay. (laughs) One person's like, yes, that was me. I got it in three. It was a total fluke. Anywho, okay, so over the next seven or eight weeks or so, so this will kind of get us right past to after Easter, we are going to be in the series called Habits. And so we're going to just quickly, very briefly define what habits are. And so you're probably asking, what are habits and why are we talking about them? Habits are, are essentially, this is how we're, hey guys, this side of the room. Thank you. Um, This is what we're going to be defining habits are. Habits are spiritual practices that place us in the stream of God's grace and draw us nearer to Jesus. Yes, there's a lot of words, but every single word in there matters. Habits are spiritual practices that we have that place us in the stream of God's grace and draws us nearer to Jesus. The reason why we're using the word habits and not the word disciplines or something like that is because sometimes you guys hear the word disciplines and you're like, oh, like disciplines are things that I plan to do. And often, uh, if you are a high schooler for any amount of time, uh, like I was, you know, I try to do things and I don't do them. and I just like end up failing in them and I get upset about it. Uh, and you're like, oh, I'm just not a quote unquote disciplined person. Uh, the reason why we're talking about using the word habits is because you all have habits. 
They're intentional and they're unintentional. Uh, so some of you put on deodorant in the mornings, uh, and some of you don't. Uh, that should be a very intentional habit to help with your, just your general hygiene. Sorry, that was probably more of a middle school joke. Um, you know, we have the habit of brushing our teeth, hopefully, twice a day. Um, some of you guys have a habit of when you're tired or exhausted, you like to just turn on Netflix and watch endless hours of it. Or, or we have all these various different kind of habits and just things that we do in our lives that kind of we just navigate through all of our lives with. And so my, my friend, uh, his name is Oscar. Some of you guys, who, who, who is that fall retreat for the guys? Okay, some of you guys know Oscar. Oscar is a, a good friend. He's way cooler than I am. He has like a thousand tattoos, and it's like, dude, so irrelevant. Uh, <laughs> but Oscar is also, uh, he, he, he also communicates th- things really well. And I was listening to him talk about habits, and this is how he described it. And I thought this was really helpful, and I want to offer it to you guys as well as a really good way of us to understand and kind of wrap our mind around what habits actually are. He says, the difference between what you know and what you do is what you love, okay? So the difference between what you know and what you do is what you love. And now let me, let me color it in for you, okay? So I know and you know that being like in physical, uh, in like good physical shape, so not necessarily meaning like being a bodybuilder, but taking care of yourself, having a healthy lifestyle, we all know and can probably agree that's a good thing. Like we should all do that. And even lots of us know how we should do that. Maybe it's like, okay, like I, you know, like I, I got to eat well. I got to make sure I'm getting enough sleep. Uh, I got to take care of myself. Maybe even get in a couple of walks or some exercise on a day-to-day basis. But what I love is tipsy cow. I love tipsy cow. Does, does anyone else like tipsy cow? Yes, okay, three people. Guys, there's a whole <laughs> endless supply of joy and, uh, and, and great, just kidding, it's not an endless supply. There's great burgers if you ever want them. Okay, so a couple of months ago, Sophia and I figured out where Tipsy Cow was and all the great stuff that they have. Like, they have this one burger. It, uh, it has, uh, like, bacon on it and eggs, and, but it's not just, like, regular bacon. It's, like, it's like deep fried, like, with maple, and it's, it's super, super good. Uh, it's more of an experience, like, you... You have to just commit, and then after you're done, you're like, man, I gotta like, <laughs> let me get, go to like the car wash and get pressure wash, like to get all this the stuff off my, you know, it's it's great. But here's the thing, I remember like, I think there was one week a couple weeks ago where I had like tipsy cow like four times in a row, like four days in a row. Um, not yeah, my veins were just coursing with uh, with grease. Um, but see. When, when it comes to my, my, my habits and when it comes to even staying in good physical shape, loving Tipsy Cow does not help me to stay in good shape because I'm just crushing my macros goals every single day uh, if I do that. It ends up ruining uh, the progress maybe that I'm trying to make, make. And so you can see here, the difference between, once again, uh, what you know and what you do is what you love. And sometimes then the thing that you love ends up uh, kind of getting in the way of what you know to be good and to be healthy for you. And so the place where our habits fall in is our habits, they shape and form the thing that we love. They shape and form our hearts. And so maybe let me put it in, uh, in another way for you. Some of you guys might be sitting here and maybe you've been here at Canyon Hills for a long time, uh, or maybe this is you know, the fir- one of your first times here. But you might be sitting here and you're like, yeah, like I know that having like, a, a vibrant faith in Christ is a good thing. And that maybe you even want that. Maybe you know that. And maybe you even know what to do. Because you've been around like the Christian thing like long enough where you know like, okay, yeah, I should probably read my Bible. And I should probably pray more. I should probably, you know, serve a little bit. Maybe join the impact team. Like I should jump into a life group, be a part of community. And maybe you know those things. You know what's good for you. You also know how to do it. But then, and so maybe you say, okay, like I'm going to will myself into doing this. You can do that for a couple of days. And then kind of your old life just kicks back in and your habits kind of kick in and you're kind of just back to doing the old same thing and you're still a little bit dejected because you're like, man, like I, I can't seem to fix me or my heart or my habits because I just, I just keep on going back to the same things. And I've been in that place. I'm sure many of you have as well. But like why, why does it feel in like that moment impossible to change? Like why do we keep on getting stuck? And I think it's because it's, it's because of our habits just like you and just like for me, I'm not going to reach maybe the fitness or the powerlifting goals that I have if all I do is loaf around and eat tipsy cow all day. 
Different kind of powerlifting, just like lifting burgers, right? Like, not going to be helpful. <laughs> but neither will I or you spiritually grow and mature in Christ unless we actually change our habits. We change the places that we go to, to to look for meaning and purpose and hope as well as the regularity of how we incorporate those things into our lives. Like we're not just going to stumble upon holiness or Christ-likeness in the middle of our lives, like tripping over a rock or a crack in the sidewalk. You're not just going to be like, oh, look, I found it. It doesn't work like that. It's something that takes time, uh, time to develop and to cultivate in our hearts and in our lives. And so that's why we're talking about habits, and that's why we're going to spend uh, the next couple of weeks unpacking some really key and important habits in our hearts and our lives, once again, these things that will shape our hearts, what we love, so that through uh, these next couple of weeks, we would genuinely be able to see change in our own hearts, as well as to be able to, to see how we might, uh, as we kind of just talked about even in this definition, that we might be able to stand and place ourselves more often in the stream of God's grace and draw us nearer to Jesus. Because at the end of the, end of the day, that's the whole goal of reading and of praying and going to life group and, and all the spiritual things that we do. It's about getting to Jesus. There, there's no award when you get to heaven for like, you completed a thousand Bible reading plans despite what the Bible app tells you when they give you little like medals for completing all your things. Like it's really at the end of the day, not about that. That's not what we're aiming for. In all of it, what we're aiming for is for Jesus. We want to be closer to him. We want to know more of him. And so reading and praying and being in community and life group together and even giving and serving are ways that we train our hearts and our habits to love the thing that at the end of the day is the most valuable in the world. And that is Jesus. And so With all that being said, where we're going to start today, um, as Josh reminded me earlier, is like the hard mode version, uh, because he's like, you're talking about the thing that's like the least clear of all the things. But I think it's the one thing that is actually the key to all the other habits that we might have in our lives. I believe it's essential, yet it is the least talked about thing when it comes to our habits. And it is meditation, biblical meditation. And so I think I have a definition here on the screen of what it is. So what is biblical meditation? Now, some of you guys might have heard the word meditation uh, at at school or from your friends. And commonly what's understood about the word meditation is this idea of like, man, like I've got to empty my mind and my head of all the stuff that's in there so I can finally like kind of get into the state where I can think clearly. And that is worldly meditation. That's not what we're talking about here at all. Biblical meditation is actually the complete opposite. So the definition is simply just this. Biblical meditation is this, the spiritual practice of filling our hearts and our minds with God's, tr- God's word and his truth so that we might experience him and his truth. So it's the complete opposite of emptying ourselves. It's actually filling our hearts and our minds with Jesus and who he is and what he has done and how that applies to our lives and thinking through it over and over and over again. The, even the Hebrew word for this word meditation is the word murmur. It means like we, it's something that we say over and over and over again. It's like this repetitious uh, thing that we do that we spend time time and again, mulling over God's truth and his word for the explicit purpose of actually experiencing it. Now, now let me just ask a question here. How many of you guys have read the Bible? Like you you go and read the Bible and you're like, cool, like I either felt nothing um, or or like nothing happened, you just close it and you kind of like walk away. Has anyone had a couple of, thank you for the honest people. Um, Often, why sometimes, why that happens, so I'm not saying every single time, But often why that might happen and we feel like we get nothing out of it is because we've missed meditation. We've missed the integral practice of actually applying it and thinking about it in our hearts so much to the point that it would actually stir up something in us. I'm not just talking about an emotional experience here, but I'm talking about that it would actually help our minds to take joy in the truth of God. Now, some of you guys also, maybe you're like, okay, well, I got to read and I got to pray. And so you get done reading and you have that same feeling where, okay, like, I don't know what I'm getting from this. And you go to pray and you're just like stumbling over your words and you're like, uh, God, uh, just do this and just do that and just get off my back. Amen. Uh, like, <laughs> have any of you guys, maybe your prayer life feels a little bit like dry? Yeah, th- thank you. <laughs> Very aggressive in the back. Like, 
your prayer life feels dry. And I would say, once again, I think one of the reasons might, why it might be, this might, might, might not be the reason, but one of the reasons why it could feel that way is because, once again, we haven't actually meditated on God's word. Meditation is like when you, uh, if you have like a super, super old car, you've got to let it warm up in the morning. You have to like warm, you have to let your car like get ready so that it can actually go somewhere. And in the same way, our hearts are like that. Our hearts are, are typically cold and it takes time for our hearts to warm up. And so when we try to go into praying just right off the bat, it, it feels kind of weird. It kind of feels like we're, we're having you know, this, 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 this maybe awkward conversation with God. I think the missing piece, once again, is meditation. Now, once you've, you've sat and you've spent time thinking about mulling over, kind of rehearsing in your mind again and again and again and applying uh, what God's word is saying into your heart, into your life, and thinking about all the angles in that it actually very naturally, it just feels, it feels like, like when you meet up with a friend that you know really, really well and you just jump right into conversation. That's what meditation, kind of biblical meditation does when it even comes to our prayer life. And so that, none of that was in my notes, but I think that's some, some helpful stuff to kind of help us to connect some of these ideas and why it's so important for us to start here before we jump on to uh, other topics like reading and praying and giving and serving. And so here's kind of like the big idea that, I, and obviously the passage that we're going to be in today. So we're going to be in Psalm 1, uh, just the first three verses of Psalm 1. So if you don't know where that is, you just open up your Bible kind of like halfway, and you find the book, big book with 150 chapters in it, and you go right to the beginning, Psalm 1. And out of Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3, this is the big idea that I want you to walk away with today. It's that the foundation of spiritual habits is delight in and meditation on God. The foundation of spiritual habits is delight in and meditation on God. And so let me just make a caveat here. I know that when we start a series, there's like a lot of big ideas that I'm trying to put together here. And so this is like the introduction to the whole series. And now we're actually like getting into the sermon. And it's, tr- it's going to be a shorter sermon. So don't worry, we're not going to go for like another 40 minutes here. Uh, Tim looks at the clock and is like, oh, no, uh, we just started. But this is where we're going to start. We're going to start here in Psalm 1, in verses 1 through 3, and we're going to unpack this, and we're going to connect this idea of meditation and delighting in God into our hearts, into our lives, and then we're going to spend some time applying it as well. And so this is what I want you to get out of our text today. So uh, let's just read for a moment um, these three verses, and then we'll, we'll, we'll unpack them together. So Psalm 1, verse 1, it says this, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree that is planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in all that he does, he prospers. Okay, and here's the first point. Biblical meditation is intentional thinking about God and his word. Biblical meditation is intentional thinking about God and his word. Now, this psalm functions as kind of the beginning, the introduction to the entire book of Psalms. And this book of Psalms is a book of songs. It's a book of prayers. It's a book of literally concentrated, focused, biblical meditations about who God is. It's David and many other people trying to remind and and, and help their hearts to see who is God and how do I bring God into the very things that are going in my life, the things that are going on in my life, the suffering, the pains, the joy all that thing. And so the, in a way, the, it's so fitting that he starts here because he comes, it's like, it's like a really good, it's a really well-written essay, which some of you guys might not know how to do. And a really, really well-written essay, the first sentence in your essay explains what you're doing in the essay. So if you want to read, if you want to read a book really fast, just read the first sentence of every paragraph and you'll find out really, really fast whether or not someone's a good writer or not, because you kind of give it away at the very beginning. And he starts here in these first couple of verses and he kind of explains the same thing and he come and, and, and all these different psalmists, all these different people who are writing come back to this idea time and time and time again of these two characters, the, the righteous man and the wicked man and this idea of delighting in and meditating on God's word day and night. And so we find these two characters. Do you guys see them there? Do you guys see the righteous and the wicked in that text? Can 
Can I get a thumbs up from some people? Okay, great. Thanks, Dawson. Appreciate it. Okay, so we have these two characters in here. And it says that one is blessed, but rather that one is, and the other one is wicked. And so these two characters, they have two very, very different ways of thinking, but yet they both have habits in their lives. So we see it says that blessed is the man, and it kind of sets him apart from the wicked person. And he said, who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. And so if we flip that around a little bit, what we see is that he's actually talking about this other kind of person, this, this wicked kind of person who he has this habit of walking and standing and sitting in these certain areas of life and how that begins to affect him. And so here's what's a little bit confusing, even as I was reading this. He moves from concrete ideas like walking, standing, and sitting, but then he connects them to spiritual ideas like counsel, which we can say is wisdom, or the way of sinners, which is like, okay, like, is there a street called the way of sinners? No, it's this thing referred to in the Proverbs of like, there are these avenues that we go down in our lives that are sinful, that actually lead us to sin. And in the seat of scoffers, which I think if we can just like, we can understand, I think it's, he's talking about community. It's the kind of people that we end up being around and how those three areas be kind of begin to shape and form who we are. And if we make the regular habit of living and existing in those places, then actually it's gonna be harmful to us. If we, once again, if all, all, all we listen to is the counsel of the wicked, the way of sinners, or the seat, or we sit in the seat of scoffers. We, we are around these people who maybe are, 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 are not leading us towards Christ. But then we see that the righteous is, is described a little bit more. He says, blessed is the man that essentially, verse two, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. And we see here that there's actually a bit of thinking going on in the righteous man's mind. And it's this. It's that before he even thinks about where he walks and where he sits and where he stands, the thing that is of first importance in his heart and in his life is delight in the law of the Lord, and on this law he meditates day and night. And from that place, then he goes into the rest of his life. So God is not an afterthought to him. He's the first thought, his first habit, his first love, the thing that his heart and his life is angled on towards is delighting in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night. And so all this helps us to see, okay, get the point, Henty, like meditation, delight in God, that's great. But what the heck is that? <laughs> like, what, what do you mean delight? Like, no one, like, hardly anyone uses delight except to describe, like, I don't know, ice cream flavors. Like, like no one uses that word anymore. But even meditation, okay, like, you've, you've talked about what it is, you know, but, but, like, you know, you talked about the idea, but what is it actually in practicality? Like, what does it look like in every single day life? And so it's, it's simple in one way because you actually already know how to do it, but also it's difficult because it takes a lot of focused attention and time, which, if I know anything about the world that we live in right now, it's really, really hard to focus. We have lots and lots of things that are distracting us and that are vying for our attention, and it actually raises the importance then of why meditation is so valuable to us. So here's, let, let, me, let me help you to see that you actually know already how to meditate. Have any of you ever worried about anything? Yes? Yes? Okay, so maybe you guys had a test coming up, right, that you're really worried about, or maybe you got like a really, really cryptic text from the person you like, and you're like, what, what do I do? What does it mean? They put a regular smiley face instead of a, like the other one, and like, what is it? Oh, there's an exclamation point, or it's like the K with the period, and you're like, oh no, like it's over, it's done, you know, and you're thinking about it, like, and you're thinking about it, and you're like, okay, no, 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 I'm going to show it to my friends, like, what does this mean? They're like, no, no, dude, it's over, it's done, like, nothing's happening anymore, or it's like, oh no, she's totally into you, right, okay, so 
The same way that we would sit there and think about something over and over and over and over again. Once again, maybe you're stressing about some assignment at school. Maybe you're, my wife loves to be a part of group projects uh, because she ends up being the one who does all the work. Maybe you're the person or maybe you're the really bad person who doesn't do all the work and shame on you. Um, and, and you're the person who's doing all the work and you're warring and you're like, ah, like I can't sleep at night. I just wake up dreaming about like this teacher being like, you get an F because your work is terrible. And like you're, you're sitting there warring about it, thinking about it, taking up your time, it's moving your emotions, you're stressed out. Guys, that's meditation. You all know how to meditate on something. We just tend to spend all of our time or a lot of our time meditating on the wrong things. We know how to bring something up again and again and again and again and to think about it and to look at it from different angles and then to maybe even pray about it, throw up a prayer to God, like, God, help me with this test I didn't study. Um, you know, like, we, <laughs> I just got you. Uh, <laughs> but, like, we, we, we do all of, like, we do all of those things and we actually know how to meditate and we do it quite often but what we need to do and what we need to see in that is because we know how to do that, it actually doesn't mean that then meditating is wrong or it's bad, but it actually shows us that God has, de has designed our minds and our hearts to think about, to uh, ruminate on, to murmur over and to think over again and again and again and again these things. He's designed our minds and our hearts to do that, and the greatest version of that is that we would do that based on God's word. And based on God's truth, that the same amount of time that we might spend trying to decipher a text message that you get from your friend group or the person you like, that you would spend more time potentially, here's a challenge, spending time thinking about what does God's word actually mean and how does it apply to my life and how can I work it into every single avenue and category of my life so I don't just live this compartmentalized version of Christianity where I'm a Christian here on Sundays and Wednesdays, but then the rest of my life at school, I'm not. Right? Like... And if we don't sit there and think about that over and over and over again, then we're going to end up finding that we're living these lives. That like, like there's just these holes in our lives where God is just not present. And meditation then becomes not something that leads us to despair, but actually leads us to joy and it leads us to delight in God. Because like, like how many of you guys have, there's a situation going on in your life and you've prayed to God about it, you've sought biblical and godly counsel about it, like, what's the difference between that situation and in a situation where you're just worrying and you're not going to the Lord with it? It's completely different. I would say the one experience where you're actually going to the Lord, it leads to some amount of joy. And joy not meaning like, oh, happy, I'm just so happy I'm in this suffering right now. As much as it means joy in knowing I've brought God into this and God's gonna get the final say. And even if I don't hear the answer that I want, I know God has walked through me, has walked through this with me, and I can take joy and confidence and see his goodness in that. See, that's what we're aiming for, is that meditation would actually bring us to this space, biblical meditation would bring us to the space where we're intentionally thinking about God and his word and bringing it into our very hearts and lives in every single aspect, time and time again. And so that's, that, that's, that's what biblical meditation is and how it can be helpful to us. And so let's kind of just cut right to the chase and cut to the benefit of what uh, biblical medica med meditation, medication, <laughs> biblical meditation, ha ha ha, there's nothing to that. Uh, <laughs> biblical medication is God's word, just uh, read it, a, a, doly, uh, a daily dose will help you out. Um, and more than that, okay, sorry, dad joke, you're welcome, finger guns. Uh, okay, second point. Biblical meditation, it refreshes, it enriches, and it grows us. Biblical meditation refreshes, enriches, and grows us. Now, guys, let's, let's go back and let's read verse 3. And, 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 and let's just be honest for a moment. We're going to read verse 3, and you're going to be like, man, I want my life to be like this. It says, so the righteous man, he is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Like that, that's what we want. No one is sitting here being like, yeah, I want a really terrible life. Sign me up. No one wants that. 
<laughs> dude, put down your hand. Uh, like, <laughs> that was a very middle school thing of you to do. Uh, <laughs> but no one actually wants that. No, no one in their right mind is sitting here saying, I just want a really, really terrible life. Everyone at the core of who they are is saying, like, I want to have a life that has meaning in it. That in which there's hope in it, that there's love in it, that there's purpose, that I do something meaningful with my life, that I'm able to have meaningful relationships and friendships. But even that, I would, my heart even would be, and maybe this is a couple more steps down the road, but that our hearts, that we would truly have actual peace with God, that we would know why we were created and, and why he's made us and how we can bring his love and his grace into the world. Maybe that's a couple steps further down the road of where, from where you're at now. But this is the kind of life that actually we want and that we're yearning for. Even though you might be looking for it in other places, maybe it's athletics or sports or academics or school or family or maybe the college you're going to go to, at the end of the day, what you're looking for is this. You're looking for the very thing that's going to give you life. And the very thing that's going to give you life is not all those other things. It's right here in front of your face right now. It's Jesus and it's being planted near the stream of water. And so when we practice biblical meditation, once again, what we are doing, and and using the same analogy here, we are placing ourselves into the very stream of God's grace. We're stepping into the stream, the stream that is like cascading down from heaven through the very blood of like of Christ and the cross that's coming down towards us. It's this stream of living water that's pouring down from heaven to us. And, and God is just inviting us to get into the stream to stand in it and let God's grace and his mercy from Christ wash over us and refresh us and and clean us and make us pure, but also help us to to know him and to see him, that we might experience him. And when when we are in that place then, where we are experiencing God's grace and his mercy, then we can actually draw near to him. Right, because like if you're if you're in an argument with someone, like you're not just gonna be like, give me a hug, dude. This is great. Like, no, because there's literal and figurative like strife between you. And if you don't understand God's grace and His mercy, then that still that that same kind of feeling exists because you think that maybe God's against me. He doesn't like me. He doesn't want to be with me. He's given up on me. He's not interested in me anymore. But yet in Christ, we find the initiator God who says, no, 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 I came to earth to die for you so that I could be with you. And then through faith and us humbling ourselves before God, then we can actually enter into the space where we are at peace with God. Once again, that we get into the stream and we are able to draw close to him and experience him. And so then we are, if we have placed faith in Jesus, we are like this tree that's planted by the stream of water. And the best place for a tree to be is right next to the the source of the very thing that's going to give it life. And it says here that when this tree is planted there, by the stream of water, it does what it's supposed to do. It bears fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither. And in all that he does, he prospers. And so this is not like a great, I get a mansion and nice cars. Just make that disclaimer on the front. But it means that like connect, even connect this to John 15 where it talks about the, the, you know, the, the vine and the vine dresser who's Jesus and, 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 and the fruit. Like John 15, 8 says, by this God is glorified that we would bear much fruit and so prove to be his disciples. And so bearing fruit in our lives, growing even then in the fruit of the spirit is the very evidence that we are part of God's family if we've placed faith in him. So we bear fruit. Not only do we do that, but our, it says its leaf does not wither. And even like I came home from my trip this past week and like I, for, I forgot to ask Hannah to water my plants in my office and they're all like super sad boy plants. Like, like everything is just like, like down and, and I'm like, what do I do? I, I texted Sophia a photo and I was like, I killed my plants. And she's like, just give them water, they'll be fine. And I gave one of the plants water and I kid you not, like four hours, the plant's like, <gasps> like it's so happy. It went from like really sad Wally to like, yay. Like, and like it was, it was awesome. And I was like, man, like that's exactly what God's word 
And the living water of who Jesus is and what he has done does to our hearts when we let it sink into the soil of our hearts. It revives us. It, it brings us back to life. And, we, and obviously we, we, we do this through obviously things like reading and praying and spending time with God. But once again, it's this, it's, it's this meditation. It comes into all of that. And it's the thing that we think about and we, we, we go through all the categories in our hearts and our lives and we, and we try to apply God's word to that so that God's word would be in all of us. And we might only have five or 10 minutes to do that, but we try and do that as much as we can in our hearts and our lives every single day, or at least, at least we, we aim at that. And sometimes we succeed at it and sometimes we, we fail at it. And so here, here's what I think the struggle is for us in this is that especially where we find ourselves in our day and age, I think our struggle with this is that we want biblical meditation to be potentially like a phone, right? So if you want to, I don't know, send a text message on your phone, you open it up, you do face ID, whatever it is, you send a message, boom, it's sent. Everything within less than 10 seconds, you can send a message to someone else. It happens like that. It's not how your heart that's not how meditation works. It's not as simple as opening up the Bible app and reading a chapter and then hitting as satisfying as it may be to hit that little thing, that little button, and it's like, bing, and it gives you a little check mark, and you're like, yes, did it. Like, it's, it's more complex than that. Our hearts, thankfully, are more complex than that. God has created our hearts to feel, to experience, to be able to understand logic and truth and belief and to see how it all makes sense that God has done some pipe dream, but that he's actually really thought all of this out. And he's thought out how to save us and how to make us new and how to bring us into his plan of redemption. But not even just like on a huge 30,000 foot level, but he's also thought through very, very specifically and carefully how he made you and how he can love you and apply his grace and his mercy to your heart. That's why he puts the Holy Spirit inside of all of our hearts. And so thankfully, our hearts are not like a phone that you can just turn on and turn off and check the button and you're all done. Our hearts are complex. And it requires time to think about, to apply, and then maybe even then to like soak in and rest in what God has said in his word. And so let's, let's maybe get back to these first couple, these first kind of words that we said that biblical meditation, like what it does, um, and, and looking at how it refreshes us, looking at how it enriches us, and looking at, at how it grows us. And so, so part of this is an exercise in meditation itself that we would actually stop long enough to think about this and p- apply it to our hearts. And so Maybe this is a bit of a, 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 a disclaimer as well, but like as we go into groups this next week, and even as you go into your quiet time I, and, and your time with God, uh, maybe on, on maybe this next week, maybe you start doing that or you keep on doing that. I want to encourage you to just to, to just to slow down. Don't rush through it. There, there's no award at the end. But slow down, and and there might be a verse or a couple of words or a phrase that sticks out to you, and stop right there and think about it, pray about it, and apply it to even your own heart and your mind. And so what we're even just going to do right now is we're going to meditate on the gospel. And the gospel is simply that Jesus has come. God the Father sent Jesus on a rescue mission to earth to come and to save us from our sins. And he did that through living a perfect life on our behalf. And then he went to the cross and he died an innocent death on our behalf, taking the punishment that our sin deserved, that should have fallen on our heads. He took that on him and he bore the full weight of that. And he died. And then he resurrected on the third day and he ascended to the Father in glory and in perfection. And now Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you and I and offering faith and grace to us that we might be in relationship with him, that if we believe in what he has done, we place faith in what he has done for us on the cross, that we can find salvation and life and peace with God. 
That is the gospel, and it is beautiful, and it is good. But how does the gospel refresh us? How does it enrich us? How does it grow us? Here's just, just one, one or two very, very few ways that it does. It refreshes us because in a world that demands, just, just think about it this way. Try and apply it to your life. And you're saying, what is the gospel telling me to do? The gospel is not telling you to do more like the world is telling you to do. The gospel is not telling you that you have to be better in order to be a part of it. Rather, the gospel is saying, Jesus did it all for you. You can rest in him. He did all of the hard work. And he has dealt with your sin finally on the cross. Praise be to God. And we can rest in that. And friends, that is refreshing and good news because holy smokes, if you walk out of these doors, everyone, you just go on your Instagram feed for two seconds and it's all about how pretty, how nice, how much, whatever it is, all these things get better, have more. And there's no value in those things whatsoever. And so it's refreshing to hear the truth that even though I sinned against God, that he sent his son Jesus to die so that I might have new and real life. So that's just one way that the gospel can, inf- that can refresh us. The gospel enriches us sim- simply in that what you think of most, that's the thing that you will love most. And so I, I always like to use the, the analogy that like the, the, the greatest day of my love for Sophia was not the day that we got married. Actually, the day that we got married was prob- is is in terms of the marriage, was the lowest day of my love for Sophia. And you might say, whoa, logically it works out. Here's how. Because every day, because every day since then, I have grown in knowing how to love my wife and how to care for her. I know more about her now than I did two years ago. You see, friends, the world is selling you this lie that that like truth and epiphany is all about just like one major push. And if you can just find that one silver bullet, that one thing, you know, it's, it's all gonna work out and instantly you'll be wise and you'll have a platform and you'll be an influencer, whatever it is. And maybe you don't desire any of that, that kind of stuff, but like that's what the world is selling us. That, oh, just find this one thing and that's gonna solve all the problems. But I think what we miss in that and the truth that we miss in that is that actually what enriches and what gives us life, what gives us wisdom, what gives us understanding of how to walk through the world is love over time. That the more time you spend in God's word, the more time you spend loving God's word and loving God and who he is and what he does, the more valuable he becomes. The more enriched your life becomes by what is in here. And so that's even just one small way that the gospel might enrich your life, that you know, man, it's like, once again, planting seeds in soil. Over time, not instantly, you will reap fruit from it. And lastly, and hopefully briefly here, how does, how does the gospel even grow us, or how does meditation grow us? Once again, it's this, it's this slow, long habit in the right direction. And so if you want to be a, a person of godliness or a person of integrity or even a per- person worth, worthy of following or if you want to be a faithful husband or wife one day, mother or father, which you're like, dude, I'm not thinking about that, uh, like, or even just a faithful college student or high school student, you just want to be a good team member, it starts with thinking about, I think, with God's word and thinking what work can I, and what work can I put in today so that tomorrow I might, be a little, I might look a little bit more like Jesus. I might act a little bit more like him. I might talk a little bit more like him. Where does that start? It doesn't start tomorrow. It starts today. And that's where meditation begins every single day for us. That's where all of our habits begin. It begins with today. And what can I do today to help to shape and form my heart and what I love so that over time I would be that my life would look like a greater reflection of Christ and the gospel. And so habits then, they're not just things that we do for the sake of doing them. Our habits then, they are, they are spiritual practices that place us, once again, in the stream of God's grace and they draw us nearer to Jesus. They refresh us, they enrich us, they grow us. And I'm excited for the next about seven or eight weeks for us to unpack all these things together. And I genuinely do hope from the depths of my heart, and I know I'm going a little bit long here, but just please be gracious with me because I, because I think this last thing is really important. 
what I really, really hope and what I'm really, really praying for is that in these next couple of weeks, that Bible reading and prayer would come alive to you. That it would not be the same old rote, I just gotta do this because everyone's telling me I need to do it thing anymore. But that in it, you would step into this roaring river of God's grace and that in it, you would find that Jesus is not far from you, but Jesus is near and he's close to you and he wants to be in a relationship with you. That's the goal. If, if, we, miss, if we miss that, then we've missed the boat. <laughs> That's what we're aiming at. We're aiming at more of Jesus. So let's pray and then we'll head out. Father in heaven, we, we want more of your son, Jesus. We want more of you, um, Father, as John the Baptist prayed, uh, Father, would, would we uh, decrease so that you would increase? And so, Father, even in our habits, in our meditation, in our reading, in our praying, in our serving this week, would you increase? Would your gospel become more beautiful to us? Would your glory and your beauty and your grace become so sweet? And would we, Father, stay there in the stream of your grace? and draw near and close to you. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Thank you, guys. You guys are dismissed.